Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our edition of Live from NORLAB at Kit Peak. I'm your host, Rob Sparks, and we have Jamika Marshall, our moderator, in the chat room. Hi, Jamika. Our guest today is John Glasby, a retired astronomer here in Tucson. And John is going to give us a very interesting presentation on the history of Kitt Peak and the founding of uh, creating the first U.S. National Astronomical Observatory, which of course folks on Kitt Peak National Observatory here in Tucson. It's a very interesting presentation. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Remember, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and Jamika will address them and relay, relay them to John. First, I'd like to tell you a little about Kitt Peak National Observatory. Kitt Peak is funded by the National Science Foundation and is a NOAA lab facility. It was founded in 1958. It's located about 55 miles southwest of Tucson on land leased from the Tona Otham Nation. We are indebted to them for letting us use one of their sacred mountains for astronomical research. Kitt Peak is home to over two dozen optical telescopes and two radio telescopes. And I'd like to show you an image of Kitt Peak that I took of 2017. This is one of my images. It's the sun setting behind Kitt Peak National Observatory as seen from Mount Lemmon. I put this picture up this week and I chose this one because it was taken on December 24th, 2017. There's about a week's time from uh, December 17th to December 24th every year when you can actually get this picture from a turnout near the Thimble Peak Overlook on the Mount Lemmon Highway. So obviously that window opens tomorrow. So as you can imagine, I will be going up and trying to take more images like this in the next week. Note at the top of uh, the sun there, you see what's called a mock mirage green flash. A mock mirage is characterized by a little piece of the sun appearing to break off and drift away from the sun, which is exactly what you see at the top of the sun right there. A fairly rare phenomenon, but one that uh, you can catch sometimes here in Tucson and lots of places, to be honest. So it's a very neat phenomenon to catch and photograph. So next, I'd like to introduce our guest. Uh, John Glaspie earned his Bachelor of Science from the Case Institute of Technology in 1966 and his PhD in 1971 from the University of Arizona. His career took him to many interesting places, including the University of British Columbia, the University of Montreal. The, he was the Associate Executive Director at the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope, Operations Manager at the Hobby Eberly Telescope, Science Operations Supervisor at Kitt Peak National Observatory, Facility Manager at the Multiple Mirror Telescope, and finished his career at Kitt Peak National Observatory prior to retiring in 2010. He specialized in instrumentation, telescope operations, and observatory management. At this point, I'd like to welcome our guest, John Glasby. Hi, John. Hello there, Rob. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You may share your screen and start your presentation now. All right, let's see if I can make it happen. All right, well, folks, uh, as uh, as Rob described, I uh, uh, in fact got my PhD here in Tucson, the University of Arizona, where I also worked several summers uh, at Kitt Peak, which was still uh, then quite quite young. So I, in a certain sense, I go I go way back uh, over fifty years to Kitt Peak, but then of course I went uh, went elsewhere. But I still find my my memories of uh, of Kitt Peak back in those days very exciting. And it certainly had a, a big impact on my career the rest of uh, the rest of my career. Uh, the first, the pictures that I'm showing right now uh, is kind of a then and now. The uh, one on the left is March 56. That's was a picture taken by uh, the first astronomer, actually the, the first director of Kitt Peak, when they first uh, were able to visit the mountain. And then on the right is a uh, approximation of, of the same site, the same angle, the same view, uh, which shows, as you see, uh, many more uh, telescopes that have been uh, built over the year, over the decades. So let's see if I can uh, make this happen here. There we go. Now, the history of this was uh, in 1952, an astronomer named John Irwin published a brief paper in which he was proposing uh, that uh, different uh, universities then uh, get together and build a photoelectric telescope. That, that's one that does photoelectric uh, photometry, would do photoelectric photometry, which was then sort of a rising uh, field in, in uh, observational astronomy. And I'll get, come back to that in a few minutes. So he got the University of Arizona, Ohio State, and Indiana University to propose to the NSF for some funding. Well, the NSF turned it down, but they thought it was a nice idea and set up a broader, what they called an ad hoc committee to study this idea in, in detail. 
uh, and they met uh, uh, a year or so uh, after, I believe it was, in Flagstaff, I believe. The, uh, they, yes, they met at the Lowell Observatory and they recommended expanding the whole concept to create uh, what would then be called the National Astronomical Observatory with uh, a variety of telescope uh, apertures and instruments that would be available to any professional researcher. Now, just a slight digression for those people who uh, may be new to astronomy or not familiar with what it was doing back in those days. Um, at the top, I list some of the topics that were very popular at the, at the time. Uh, observationally, uh, a lot of work was going on studying the, the stars, usually the, the brightest stars, uh, clusters of, of stars, of course, in, in our galaxy, and then the structure of the galaxy itself. There was a fairly limited amount of work going on to uh, studying external galaxies. And the places that could do it were places like Mount Palomar and Mount Wilson and Lick Observatory, um, which had uh, a you know, variety of telescopes also. And uh, the picture at the, at the lower right is a, uh, an image of a plate that was taken of uh, showing spectra of a variety of, of stars that were being studied by, uh, by somebody. Uh, and uh, it's all dark because this is a negative. That's what astronomers, uh, observational astronomers work with. Uh, and so something, anything that's dark uh, means that it's fairly bright. And you see right in the middle, I don't know if the pointer is visible, but there's a uh, fairly dark spectrum that goes uh, quite a ways off to the left. And that indicates the left in this case is the blue region and, and even near ultraviolet region of the, uh, of the visible wavelengths. And off to the right would be uh, the end of the sensitivity of the photographic plate usually. And that's uh, sort of in the green, uh, green yellow region. So that's what, what people were working with. Another thing they were using, and here is, is an example of a photomultiplier tube. This is one particular brand, an ITT FW130, which uh, became very popular later on. Uh, it probably wasn't being used in the, in the 50s when they were first building uh, Kitt Peak. Uh, the light from the telescope would be imaged, basically you put an image of the primary mirror uh, on that narrow flat surface at the, at the far right. The light coming in, each photon would knock a, uh, could knock a electron off and then there was a potential gradient down into the, uh, to the left there, which would accelerate the electrons. They'd strike a surface, generate more electrons. Those electrons would strike another surface, generate more, and so on, until you got a measurable signal that you could uh, detect out of, out of the end of it. Photometry measures how bright the star is uh, using different filters. You would uh, uh, have, in this case, there are some curves there on that uh, plot that looks like funny lumps, little mountains. Uh, the one on the right represents the visual wavelength uh, in those days. The middle would be the blue and then the left would be ultraviolet. So this was an example of a, of a photometric system, uh, which was the U, U uh, ultraviolet, uh, uh, the blue and the visual. Uh, the other lines on this plot and uh, the bottom axis represents blue on the left all the way to red on the right, they show different temperature stars. And so you can imagine that by the ratio of the signals coming from the visible to the blue to the ultraviolet, you could first make an approximation as to what temperature the star was. Now in 1954, the, this ad hoc panel uh, recommended Dr. Aiton Meinl, who was then at Yerkes Observatory, to head the site selection process for this uh, uh, future observatory. Uh, and Dr. Meinl was well known then uh, for his uh, instrumentation uh, developments, his optics, uh, optical uh, instruments, and his in innovative way to, uh, uh, to approach things. So he started actually before he was officially supposed to and came by, came through Tucson on a trip to the West Coast and stopped to talk to people at the University of Arizona just to see uh, what they thought of all this. Now, in the spring of 1955, to begin their selection process, uh, uh, Meinl and his uh, then very small team arranged for an, an astronomer who was then working at McDonald Observatory in West Texas named Helmut Apt uh, 
to conduct an aerial inspection of the mountains in New Mexico and certain and mostly uh, Arizona, uh, flying around. He rented had a, a, a pilot rented a, a man with his uh, uh, his small private plane, and they flew around uh, taking notes, flying over the uh, a, a whole series of uh, mountains in in the in the West here, and taking notes as they as they went. The uh, there's a, a log book that Helmut wrote up, uh, which I show a little photograph here, one page from it. And you see there's an arrow here indicating a remark and it says, Kit Peak from the Northwest, looks better, more trees, investigate. That was it. Uh, his notes were very uh, brief. You can see uh, the others here. Here's another uh, very uh, uh, rocky summit that uh, uh, would probably be uh, uh, poor selection. And then if you're really interested in some cute history at the very bottom, they stopped in Tucson that night, refueled, supper was $1.70, motel $7, and a movie $2. So I never did ask Helmut App what movie they got to see. So after uh, Helmut made that flight and brought back his notes on, on the possible, uh, the most interesting mountains that he saw, uh, Meinl flew down, to, uh, at least went down to McDonnell Observatory, and uh, there's a picture of Aiden Meinl sitting with the official observatory then Jeep, uh, where they wanted to drive around uh, and visit as many of the interesting sites as they could, and hopefully to get up to the top and see if they were, you know, had a, had a usable uh, terrain that where observatory domes could be built. Uh, but there was no access road to the top of Kitt Peak. Uh, Kitt Peak is, is on the Tonawatham Reservation, as we call it now, then they were called the Papago uh, Reservation. And so they asked the local district where Kitt Peak was located, called uh, Shuktok, for permission uh, to go up to the summit. Well, initially they were refused. There was some argument going on by, in the uh, district council there. Uh, but uh, eventually they decided to invite the Tonawatham uh, Council to Tucson to look through the 36 inch telescope on the campus, the university campus of the Stude Observatory for a kind of a, a, st a star party and, and to look and see what, you know, this is the kind of things astronomers are studying. And we don't really know what the people said there because uh, they were talking all in their own language, but uh, apparently they decided this was worth uh, proceeding uh, with. And so they gave permission for uh, Helmut, uh, for, sorry, for uh, Aiden and his uh, team to go up to the summit. Well, uh, Helmut App came back, sorry, I have to go back to, go back one uh, slide here. I'm getting, this is, uh, Sorry, the trouble with using a mouse sometimes. Uh, App was was uh, available again, and so uh, Helmet and uh, Helmet App and Aiden Mindel decided to hike up to the summit uh, to see what it looked like. But they were stopped by very heavy undergrowth. Uh, there was no direct trail that they knew of how to get up there, so they just kind of guessed, and they got stopped by very heavy, uh, uh, you know, small trees that blocked the way. So they had to give up. They went back to the district and asked if they could get hire some guides uh, to take them up there, and uh, that's what uh, and indeed uh, the Shukuk uh, people agreed. There were some people at the meeting who kind of nodded; they would do it. And so uh, the the next uh, thing that I want to show you is a few minutes from a movie that they managed to take uh, while they were up visiting the uh, the summit. So. This documents some of the travel. Now, people who have been to Tucson might recognize some of these views here. This is as you leave Tucson, heading out towards the Kitt Peak direction. And there's a sign for Old Tucson, which is, is a great, was a great tourist uh, attraction. And then that's the road that, uh, with the sign, last chance for beer and wine. Uh, that's Aiden heading back to, to the Jeep on, on, this, uh, uh, on this trip. We, we often joke that that was probably the first time he ever wore those, uh, those uh, Levi's or, or jeans anyway. And this is a pretty common scene of the saguaro cactus uh, that's uh, are common in this, in this part of Arizona. 
That is the Coyote Mountains and Kitt Peak off to the right of the road a little ways there. And right there, you're really aiming right at Kitt Peak, but you can't see it. So they met with the uh, guides at a little, what was a former village named San Vicente, just to the north of the mountain. This is Harold Thompson, who was, uh, uh, as I say here, uh, Aiden's uh, right-hand man. He was a, a farm boy from Wisconsin who was more at ease on, on, uh, with his uh, Levi's than, than Aiden was anyway. So uh, they met at this, uh, this corral uh, where the, uh, the guides brought in several horses and pack animals. And uh, that's an old stagecoach uh, sign uh, building there that had been abandoned. That's right at the same, uh, same locale. Uh, just wanted to show a few minutes of this to uh, give you kind of a flavor of what, what it was like uh, setting this, getting this all started uh, 55, you know, years ago now. This is uh, actually the spring March of uh, 56. And there's Aiden uh, getting ready to go up. And then off, off they go and, and got up to the summit. This uh, video, the, the movies I found uh, were not labeled. Uh, so I'm not sure I got all these in the right order, but we do know that they stopped on the way up and made coffee. Uh, the fellow on the, on the right there in the kind of bluish gray is actually a photographer, one of the local papers who asked if he could uh, accompany them. And you see there's the, the, the horses to ride and carrying the uh, tents and water for them to stay overnight at, up at the summit. And they were preparing to make coffee. The, uh, the bucket on the right was used to water the horses as well as make the uh, heat up the water for the, for the coffee. And uh, there they are, uh, once they got to the summit, uh, preparing to um, you know, build their, their camp and, and stay overnight. Uh, there's Harold uh, kind of climbing around, and that's a very famous view from Kitt Peak, Baba Kivari Mountain, which is a sacred mountain to the Tonopam, uh, to the south. And there's that same view that uh, we uh, saw in the first picture when they got up to the mountain and could look around. And you see, there's a lot of, lot of uh, um, you know, greenery, you might say. Those are not very big trees, uh, but there's a fair amount of uh, acreage, you might say, where they could build the, uh, um, build the, the domes. Well, that's enough for, for that to, to move on to. Uh, and the, the, here's the, uh, one of our favorite photographs showing uh, around the campfire that, that first night, uh, the two guides along with Meinl and, and Thompson. This is such a professionally uh, done, done image. Uh, clearly, they were, they were lucky that that uh, uh, newspaper photographer joined them for this visit. And while he was there, he also took a few, uh, several other pictures, which we, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to say, still have. There's uh, Meinl and uh, Thompson next to what uh, we refer to as ostrich rock. And, uh, and that was preserved. You see on the right a photo that uh, I took uh, about 11 years ago. There's a, a dome right off to the side of it there, but the rock was spared so that uh, if you know where to look, it's not visible uh, uh, from the roads or anywhere, but if you know where to look, uh, some of the history is still there. So Meinl liked what he saw. Uh, they the mountain clearly had a lot of potential as far as uh, uh, area to, um, to build on. And so he asked the district again for permission to build a small road up to the summit so they could do what they call a site survey to kind of test the conditions at the, uh, uh, at the summit for observing stars. There were four other sites that were also selected. And uh, basically they were all thought to be very similar, but one of them called uh, Kualapai was very windy. And, uh, but none of the rest of them really had much room for many telescopes, which they, uh, uh, had uh, at least an intent of building multiple telescopes up there. Here's uh, a plot that Meinl uh, did that shows the basic, uh, the most interesting mountains in Arizona, uh, Kitt Peak, Mount Graham, Chevalon Summit, and then Hualapai. Hualapai is not all that far from the Grand Canyon then too. Uh, however, uh, uh, they, they soon uh, discovered that many of those were not really of, of interest to them. Mount Graham, as it turns out, uh, was, pretty, uh, was pretty high and beyond their limits. 
And I'm just showing a map here of what the road was that they built. Uh, this is off to the north northeast of, uh, of Kitt Peak as when you're on the top. And they had a bulldozer uh, drive up the side of the mountain and, and bulldoze a uh, dirt track road. And this is what it looked like. There were, it was so steep. There was one part the, where it was, the grade was like 78%, I believe. So uh, over 40 degrees angle. And sometimes the trucks needed to be uh, towed up by the, by the bulldozer that they, uh, they had. Uh, so there was, that was their road for the site testing. And uh, along that road, they uh, towed a trailer that had this a telescope. Here's this one of their test telescopes that uh, they were using. It's a 16 inch that they had built here in Arizona to, uh, to their own design, their own specification. And it was housed in a trailer. The, the aura symbol on the, on the thing is the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, uh, which is the kind of mother um, um, entity that is the boss of, of Kitt Peak. Now the criteria that they uh, used, were going to use for, uh, for deciding which was, was the best site was that it had to have a fairly low altitude, latitude should I say, uh, to, uh, so that it had good access to the southern skies. The closer you get to the equator, then the more of the southern sky you can see. Uh, it had to have clearly good weather so that the skies are, uh, are you know, a lot of clear nights uh, per, per year and, and fairly dark. So you don't want it uh, uh, very, very close to a, to a big city. Uh, they wanted it on a mountain. They knew that the, the better, the higher up on a mountain you, you would go, the better uh, your seeing conditions got to be. But there was a stipulation there that they really shouldn't go above about 8,000 feet because at the time, people thought that that was about the limit that the astronomers would, uh, their, would shall we say, their brains would function efficiently. Uh, and so they would make good decisions uh, during their observing. Uh, we now know that was uh, much too conservative and uh, uh, the 14,000 foot Mauna Kea as an example of where people used to observe in person a lot and, and not suffer too many problems. At that altitude, you actually do uh, get confused sometimes. They also wanted it near a university with, that had an astronomy department and good transportation to the area via air, train, and road, hence a, a fairly fairly good size city. So clearly Tucson had, had an advantage in, in, the, in that regard. John, could I jump in here with a few uh questions from the YouTube audience? Absolutely. All right. So first we have Katie Garmany. So Katie, of course, um, let me know. I, I was asking Katie, I was telling her I was really glad to have her in the audience. And she's like, yes, I'm John's wife. Yes, I live in Tucson. <laughs> so we this are- This is not a planted question, yes. <laughs> yes, it definitely was not. I was just chatting with everyone and uh, I was really surprised and very happily surprised uh, to have uh, your family here in the chat with us. So aloha to Katie. Um, but we have we have people in the chat who have visited uh, Kit Peak and have uh, really awesome things to say. So um, we have Pete Z says, uh, I asked if anyone visited Kit Peak before and Pete Z says, yes, he's, um, Pete's visited several times and loves, loves, loves visiting. Um, we also have um, Alan Jackson in the chat saying um, he's, he's only visited virtually. Um, and, and then Pete Z goes on to say that uh, they actually did the overnight program, Rob, which I thought um, um, you and or John could maybe at some point tell us um, maybe a little bit more about the overnight program. Um, but Pete Z said uh, they did the overnight program and they strongly recommend uh, the Kit Peak overnight program in hopes that it will be back soon. 
um, we'll continue with, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so Alan Jackson is, is, is from Tucson at the Catalina Foothills. And so uh, really glad to have all of y'all here with us. And Pete Z is watching from Illinois and says that his son wants to be an astronomer. And so uh, he figured that Kitt Peak was one of the best places uh, to start. So uh, maybe Rob and John at some point, maybe at the end of, of uh, John's presentation, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the programs for um, young people like Pete's son who are interested in, in becoming astronomers. Yes, I also think Allison Farrow had a great question there too, Jamaica. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten to hers yet. I'm fascinated by her question. Do you mind if I ask it here quick? Go for it, yes, please. <laughs> With the unpaved roads, wouldn't the materials get jostled and perhaps damaged? I, I th take it they took it very slowly. So I'm just, I, I think that's a fun question. Is that, were there problems getting stuff up there on those unpaved roads? Well, there certainly were problems. As I say, they had to be towed up at some point if they had a heavy load in the, in the trucks. Uh, but uh, that very uh, steep grade and rough road was only used for the first few years uh, when they were doing the site testing. And then I was uh, almost going to get to the point where they uh, then had an improved road. And then now those of you who have been up to the, uh, to the site in, uh, well, since 1960, know that there's a very nice paved road that is uh, long and winding, but it is not very steep. And, uh, and is, is, uh, it is possible to bring things up now without jostling them. But yes, coming up the dirt roads, they had to be uh, slow and careful. Thank you, Rob, for bringing, uh, for adding that extra question in, because that was gonna, I was gonna wrap up with that. So I'm really glad that you um, included it, because yeah, I mean, trying to travel and bring really expensive parts that are very delicate from one place to another, I'd imagine, is just full of a lot of heartache, especially with this kind of unstable road. So thank you for all the questions so far um, in the in the audience and uh, Allison, Katie, Pete here says uh, uh, that it's, it's sad that there's so much uh, light pollution now. And Pete, what I was, I'm going to put in the chat here is that's true, but one of uh, uh, Rob's colleagues, Constance Walker is actually leading a program here, the Globe at Night to bring more uh, attention and awareness to uh, light pollution. So we'll hopefully talk about that a little bit later. Back to you, John. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much for the questions, and, and I'm certainly willing to answer any others as they come up. So yes, you've been looking at, uh, while we were talking, uh, the several of the images that were taken from Kitt Peak to show or demonstrate uh, what light pollution was, was like. The first one was uh, down in the, like 1959. Uh, and then about 20 years later, they tried to replicate that and take uh, under the same conditions uh, another picture. And then again, in 2003, we took a, yet another uh, set of pictures. These are actually panoramas of stitching together uh, many, many uh, exposure, exposures. And you do see that, yes, Tucson has grown from a kind of a sleepyish town of uh, under 100,000, maybe in the 50s, uh, to uh, approaching a million now, at least in the, in the greater Tucson area. And uh, there are many parts of the city, as you can see in the bottom, where there is a direct view uh, to the summit of Kitt Peak. And Rob uh, uh, has gotten, and other people have gotten pictures uh, of Kitt Peak from uh, without having to go up up to the summit. You can see some of the domes from very far away. So that was an example of, of why, the very top picture, why it, it did look good to them then. So the, uh, they uh, selected Kitt Peak. They got this ad hoc committee to agree that Kitt Peak was the best choice. And uh, the NSF uh, began negotiations with the tribe and uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, and here's a picture of the negotiations. That's the, uh, the tribal chairman in the, in the tan hat off on the left side. His assistant uh, with the striped shirt is kind of writing down the notes. 
There's a gentleman here uh, in, a, in the gray hat, I believe, is a lawyer who represented the, uh, the NSF and, and Aura. And then the other council members from the uh, tribe are sitting around uh, just, just waiting uh, for the final, final version, I guess, of the wording. So it defines a lease that sets aside 2,000 acres, a uh, protected area around the summit that uh, nothing would uh, be developed by the, by the tribe within that region. And there's a, a smaller section of that where the, where the telescopes are actually located. So there's a little bit of a buffer around where the telescopes are, but it's not very big. The, the lease is in perpetuity, meaning that uh, it will go on forever. There's no um, date when it, when it expires or whenever the NSF decides uh, that they no longer uh, want to have observatories up there. Uh, it says that the, the lease says, it said that the local uh, Native Americans get preferential uh, hiring. So they were uh, trying to assist, you know, provide jobs as much as possible. They established the right for the, uh, the uh, Tonatham uh, artists to sell their wares in what was uh, going to be a museum that uh, eventually opened in, uh, in 1964. But it, there's a very strict stipulation that the site is only going to be used for science and education. So there can be no commercial activities up there. Uh, those of you who want to do your own history, historical research can go find uh, a copy of the August 1958 Sky and Telescope magazine where uh, Aidan Meinl uh, wrote up a, an article describing the process that they have, were then going through still uh, to develop the observatory. And you see a picture of the then uh, top of the mountain with a, a tower there that is uh, uh, what was called a seeing tower, trying to uh, document how good the image quality was by pointing at Polaris and then monitoring it on every clear night. Now the NSF itself, uh, just to give you a little background, uh, funds project, but doesn't operate them. So Aura that I mentioned before was created to receive the funds and operate the observatory as basically like a board of directors. Uh, the lease is between the NSF and the nation via the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of the Interior. And once that was signed, uh, basically the end of October 1958, uh, Starting November 1st, that's when we say the observatory was, quote, created then, even though, of course, there was nothing up there but that little 16-inch telescope. They began with a, uh, you know, building the construction road, which has a gentler uh, grade uh, with, uh, with, you know, angles or slopes that are not, not too steep anyway, so that the bigger trucks and bigger equipment could be moved. And they immediately started planning for a paved, the public road, which only has a few percent grade that uh, the public drives, drives up when, uh, when it's open for visits. Now they also, by the way, uh, one of the telescopes they wanted to build was a solar telescope. And uh, that was the construction on that started uh, fairly quickly too. Uh, Meinl was also pushing for something kind of unique. Namely, he wanted a space division. Remember, this is post Sputnik. So uh, they wanted, uh, Meinl had already in fact been, uh, been dealing with the Air Force on uh, uh, optics and uh, image quality from, uh, from uh, telescopes that could see things when they look down. So he had hopes, uh, hopes that the observatory would uh, eventually be able to orbit a telescope and run it. And as we know, that uh, you know, quickly was handed off fairly soon anyway to NASA took over that, uh, that concept. Oops, went up the wrong way again. So this is a picture of uh, around uh, 19, probably uh, latter 1960. By then, uh, the, uh, all the construction was going on up there. This is a panorama that you probably can't see much of the detail there. Uh, there is a dome right below the second T of Kitt Peak. That's uh, for what we used to call the, um, the 84 inch telescope. It was the for the while, the longest, the largest telescope on the mountain. The first telescope that was finished was off on the uh, on the far uh, left side there, a 36-inch telescope. But in, in the foreground, if you look in detail, and it's, it's not very easy to see, there's all sorts of construction of buildings and laboratories and facilities going on. Uh, two water tanks that are, are there to uh, 
uh, for fire uh, suppression if, if, uh, if one of the buildings catches fire. And um, <coughs> all of the water that they use on the mountaintop is collected there uh, at the summit. Uh, there's a catchment basin that all the water that's uh, basically uh, during rainstorms uh, right around the summit gets funneled off to a big catchment basin there. It's treated and stored in these, uh, uh, in these tanks and that's used for uh, drinking and cooking as well as, a, as an emergency. So a lot was going on up there. They were building a small village basically on the summit. Well, once the 36-inch uh, telescope was uh, uh, finished and uh, ready to, um, to, to start observing in, in early 1960, the observatory was dedicated. Uh, so in uh, March 1960, and then Meinl immediately uh, resigned as director uh, under some pressure because it turns out some of the board people and he did not get along too well. So uh, he was uh, pushed out as director uh, and within a year, Nick Mayolf, who uh, was then in California, was named the Kitt Peak Director. And then he proceeded to uh, help develop the, the observatory towards, uh, uh, for the rest of that, uh, the decade of the 60s. Now, happily for Tucson, Meinl ended up uh, within a year over across the street, as we say, on Cherry Avenue at the Stewart Observatory, the astronomy department, where he became the director a few years later. And then uh, <clears throat> on a, uh, it was not even a whim, but because nobody else wanted to do it, he decided to create what, what he called the optical sciences uh, department, which became the seed for an incredibly important industry here in Tucson now. So we can, Tucson can thank Aiden for that. Now about that time, the, uh, the committees, Aura and the NSF were entertaining the idea to develop uh, a Southern site as well, the Southern telescopes, uh, where they could, where the astronomers could uh, study the Southern sky. I said that, uh, you know, Pitt Peak was, well, it's 30 degrees roughly from the equator, but that means the uh, most Southern part of the sky uh, in, the, in the South is not visible from Kitt Peak. So uh, everybody was interested in developing a site in the South as well. And that's led to the development of what I call here, I refer to as CTIO, which was the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory near La Serena Telescope. And that ended up with uh, uh, several telescopes as well. Now, the, the operations for those who have never uh, done this sort of a thing as an, an astronomer, uh, the National Observatory was meant to be accessible to all uh, uh, astronomers in the country who, who needed to do research and, and would, the, the technique was to write a written proposal, submit it to the observatory. A committee would then review it and rank them. Uh, they would pick the most, what, what the committee thought were the most scientifically interesting uh, of the proposals. The, what I call KPNO, the observatory assigns time on a, on a calendar accordingly. And uh, it's currently done on two, well, uh, up until recently, shall I say, it was done on two semesters. So uh, time would be scheduled February through August, uh, through July, sorry, and then uh, August through January. So uh, you could write up a proposal uh, they would do for submission by the end of September. So for example, you could write your proposal in September the decision would be made in early November. The schedule would come out in, early, in uh, late December uh, to start observing sometime between February and July. And so you, you might find out when the, uh, the schedule was published that uh, after submitting it in September, you couldn't observe until, uh, until the, the following July. So it could be you know, going on 12 months uh, from the time you first submitted the idea to when you might actually get the time to observe whatever you wanted to do. Now, as I described initially, it was there was a 16 inch telescope for the photoelectric photometry. Uh, the 36 inch, which was finished in 1960 was a multi-purpose telescope. The solar telescope, uh, which I should have included a picture here was finished in 1962, uh, which by the way, it was sometimes used as night as, as well. And then in 1964, the 84-inch uh, telescope was completed, 
uh, and, and commissioned. And that included what I call a coup spectrograph, which is a very, very large spectrograph that uh, is like a separate building of its own. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, two commercially built 16 inch telescopes replaced the original one and a, the 50 inch telescope that had been built, uh, well, it was, it was uh, being finished around 1965, 66, which was part of the space division's attempt to show you could remotely control the telescope uh, as you would have to uh, up in space. Uh, then the, uh, the old telescopes, uh, sorry, the original 36 inch was moved to Chile and replaced by two 36 inches commercially uh, done. Uh, which I pointed out to people uh, here, they never realized uh, uh, some of the staff here until I pointed out to them that uh, the primaries were actually 38 inch in diameter, and, but they still call them 36 inches. So people were, uh, would, would think they were still a, a smaller telescope. And the National Radio Astronomy Observatory built a 36 foot millimeter uh, radio dish on the, uh, in the Southwest part of the mountain uh, I, I mentioned that was, we referred to it back in the day as the Great Pumpkin because at night they would have lights on in the dome and the dome itself was nothing but a fabric covering over, over a shell uh, that did not interfere with the radio waves. So with the lights on in the, in the dome at night, the thing glowed, glowed orange for, as seen from the uh, rest of the telescopes. So this is, this is the way uh, Kit Beak, the way it looked about the time I arrived as a student in 1966 in, in Tucson. Uh, by then, Stewart Observatory had moved its 36-inch uh, telescope from the campus up to, the, uh, to Kit Beak, and they have added in even more uh, telescopes there as well. Uh, and these are the domes uh, in the distance anyway, and you can see just that triangular shape was the solar telescope, a very unique design that was uh, for many years the largest solar telescope in the world. And here's an example of the uh, picture of the 2.1 meters, we call it now the 84 inch telescope with one of the operators neatly pose, posing for it. Uh, uh, with its nice new paint job as it was still quite new at that time. Well, starting in, in the 70s, uh, things started changing a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, modern science uh, never uh, slows down. So the 84 inch coude was separated and uh, fed by separate uh, optics that they call now the coude feed. Uh, the, the, what we now call the four meter, the started off as 158 inch telescope. Uh, that was uh, commissioned in 1973. The remote control telescope really never worked. So it was converted to a observer operated infrared telescope. A uh, platform was added so the uh, observer could uh, uh, get up close to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, telescope. And uh, other universities and observatories started moving their telescopes from the Midwest uh, out to Kitt Peak as well. Tamika, do you have more questions? Yes, John, thank you. Um, you are definitely causing a lot of good discussion in the chat today. And we have Allison with another question. So um, Allison uh, says, has, well, first she mentions that there's some wintry mix going on where she is. So hope you're being safe out there, Allison. And so speaking of weather, Allison wants to know, has uh, Kitt Peak suffered any natural disasters? Not, uh, nothing major due to uh, weather, uh, not at, at the summit. We have had over the years, uh, uh, several you know, incidents, I guess you would say. For example, here's a wildfire fire that took uh, that caught uh, near the north northeastern part of, of the mountain. It never the fire never made it up to uh, to the telescopes. And in more recent years, there was another fire uh, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, or not even that. I guess that uh, that was also endangering the mountain. But the uh, wildlands fire people managed to stop it before it ever got close to to the summit. Uh, so uh, that's about it. Other than uh, yes, we we uh, uh, we uh, 
emphasize the no smoking signs to the to the visitors when uh, when it's when the mountain has been open for for visits. Uh, do not smoke up there because it gets very dry and it's dangerous. Now there is a provision. There's a helicopter landing area in the middle of the parking lot. Uh, so should something uh, uh, disastrous happen, uh, and and there was an incident involving an astronomer where luckily a helicopter was able to come and and uh, uh, you know carry him off to a hospital. But uh, uh, that was a, that was a sad incident uh, because he did not survive. And that's it. The end of my slides. So I can uh, stop unless uh, somebody wanted to see something else over again there. Certainly are welcome to ask. Well, we definitely have questions, John. Um, so let me jump back into the chat. Um, so let's go back to Allison. So Allison asks, uh, why, why don't they name the telescopes? And I had uh, just Add it uh, into the chat. In fact, that um, uh, Kit Peak operates the the four meter Nicholas Mayall telescope as well as the Wynn telescope. Um, could you tell us a little bit about those and and the naming? Uh, yes. Well, the uh, there some of the some of the telescopes are named. Uh, as you say, the Mayall telescope uh, was named after Nick Mayall, who was the the director at the time it was funded through, through the NSF and the construction began. Uh, when, when I arrived in 66, that, that peak uh, that where the telescope is uh, had just nothing, had nothing but a Jeep trail up it where they, they went up to kind of check it out as a site. Uh, and then the following year, 1967, they started blasting it and, and they basically took off half of that uh, section and built them. The dome up there, but they named the telescope after Nick Mayall. Uh, uh, similarly, in, in Chile at Cerro Tololo, the, they named the four meter down there after Victor Blanco, who, who was one of their first directors uh, starting in the late 60s and, and uh, went on well into the 70s. Uh, the only other uh, telescope that I can think of that is named on Kit Peak is the Burl Schmidt that came from Ohio, from the uh, Warner and Swayze Observatory in Ohio. But I don't know the history of who, uh, you know, who Burrow was, even though I was a student at Case back in the day <laughs> in Cleveland. There's the Bach telescope is named too. Oh, that's true. That's true. Bach and that's, Mark Bach was my advisor at the Arizona. And uh, yes, uh, I was I was there at the dedication for that when he was <laughs> he was very clear. He was a he was a gruff old fellow, uh, not gruff. Really. <laughs> he just pretended to look that way. But yes. Um, and that was a, a wonder, wonderful thing to, to honor him. And a lot of the scopes are just referred to by the names of their organizations, like the Case Western Reserve Telescope or the MDM Telescope or the Wind Telescope. So a lot of them are named after their organizations as well that run them. Right. So we had um, another question, which is somewhat answered um, in the chat, but um, Rob and John would definitely appreciate your um, clarification on this. So. Uh, the question was by um, by Alan Jackson. Which of these telescopes um, feeds into the need interferometer via the optical fibers? Um, and so uh, Katie responds that uh, Neid is on the wind telescope. Uh, can y'all give us some more insight? Well, the uh, Neid, as it, as it's pronounced, N E I D, the, the spectrograph. Uh, yes, you. was uh, proposed as a very high precision uh, spectrograph that will be used to hunt for more planets, exoplanets as they're called, that are orbiting uh, stars that are bright enough for, uh, uh, for that kind of measurement. Uh, it takes a very uh, special kind of spectrograph uh, to do that sort of measurement. And uh, uh, that's just getting uh, commissioned uh, now, I believe. It started uh, just before the shutdown and uh, they're getting it going again now. Uh, so it, it's fed just by that one telescope. And Nuid is an Otham word named uh, from the Otham language meaning to see. So I just thought I'd throw that in there too. And that was named in, in consultation with the tribe, of course. Right. 
That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for that clarification and for correcting my mispronunciation, John. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so with that, uh, let's continue here with a few more questions uh, from Pete. Pete asks, is there one significant discovery that uh, Kit Peak is known for? I'm sure there's more than one, but one that you could share with us. Oh, gee, I'm, uh, there's, there's been so, 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 so many. Um, certainly uh, one of the ones that, that intrigued us the, the most, and it wasn't by uh, discovered on a Kitt Peak telescope, but at the, uh, uh, the Stewart Observatory uh, was observing the, uh, discovered the crab uh, pulsar, I believe, the optical uh, pulsar was discovered with, with the 36 inch at the, at the time. They had uh, some very eager young astronomers on the, on the staff who went to uh, an astronomer good with instrumentation and said, that star in the Crab Nebula, I think that's the pulsar. Is there a way we could observe that and detect it? Well, it was hard because the period of the pulsar is like, you know, a 30th of a second, a 33 milliseconds or so. And so it took some special equipment and the guy who uh, they went to named uh, uh, Don Taylor, he just kind of, you know, said, oh, sure. We grab one of these instruments here and we hook it up to this thing over there. And then we ch change this timer here. And you basically add up the signal uh, from the start of the 33 millisecond period and uh, add it up in little chunks and then go back and do it again until you have a signal that is, uh, is uh, detectable that shows you the pulse. And in fact, when they were doing this, they had a tape recorder running to, for recording some of the signals. And um, they forgot to, to disconnect the mic when they started one of these uh, observing sequences. So their voices are, uh, are on the, the tape, on one of those tapes, uh, which, by the way, got uh, grabbed by the BBC for some documentary and doesn't even belong to Stewart Observatory anymore. But still, they uh, so they could play that back and you could hear them talking where, well, I think I'm seeing something. It, it is, it is. One of the, one of the astronomers, uh, uh, Mike Disney, was, it was British. And uh, so he says, it's a bloody pulse. It's a bloody pulse. And, and so they got all very excited uh, to see that. So that was really one of the most exciting things that happened. And then a few uh, uh, weeks later, I think it was, one of the Kit Peak astronomers went to the 84 inch, did the same sort of a trick with timing uh, the, the uh, observation, in this case it was a spectrograph, to the period of the, of the pulsar. And then it builds up a signal that he could see there's nothing terribly interesting there because you're, get, you're dealing with this very compact object that messes up the spectra. But he saw a little something, but uh, that was the same, same trick. Uh, there's, a, there's probably many other things that uh, uh, were, were discovered there that I just can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, there, the, one of the last, the, uh, uh, for the 50th anniversary, I think it's newsletter number 100, which is of, of uh, well, NORLAB, Kit Peak, NOAO, whatever you call it now. Uh, where you could go to the website, find the newsletters, and I think number 100 has uh, history, historical timeline showing things that were discovered uh, there, and uh, um, that would be the, the you know an easy thing to, to read online. Thank you for that 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 reference, John. Uh, for everyone in the audience, I'll try to find that and add that in the uh, video description once uh, once we have that posted. And yes, what a great <laughs> great memories to share with us and uh, an amazing discovery. Yes, so this was the optical afterglow of uh, of M one. Yes, that's amazing. Yes, amazing. So with that follow up, John, um, this will be our last question before we hand it back over to Rob. And that question is from, um, this is from Pete. And so Pete wants to know what new science is being done right now, uh, John and Rob? Well, I think the other, the, the, I would say the new at, at, at wind isn't exactly new anymore because uh, the discovery of exoplanets has been ongoing, but they, they will add to it an awful lot with this precision uh, spectrograph. 
but at the four meter, the Mayall four meter telescope, uh, they are in the process of getting working an instrument which is called the uh, uh, dark energy spectroscopic investigation. I, I forget, it's called DESI anyway. And they, are, they have a multi-fiber uh, spectrograph set up where uh, at the prime focus of, the, of the, the telescope where images are normally taken, uh, there would be fibers located, uh, positioned re uh, automatically, and then the light will go through the fibers down to the spectrographs and they'll be, I think, recording like 5,000 spectra at a time. So they're gonna to try to do a major survey of get uh, uh, spectra uh, all over the Northern sky and with some overlap of the imaging dark energy survey that was done from Saratololo called the dark energy camera. So that's one of the ones that we're all looking for, the, the DESI as it's called. Uh, it'll, it'll run for at least five years before they get enough data probably to uh, do a lot of statistics. With. Thank you so much, John. And thank you to everyone in our YouTube audience for all of your fantastic questions, comments, um, and feedback for our host today, Rob, and our science guest, John Glassby. Thank you so much, uh, John. I really appreciate you answering all of these amazing questions for us. And if there are any other questions that come up in these last few minutes, I will try to add them at the very end as Rob uh, wraps up. But I would like to request, Rob, um, if you could mention a little bit about maybe the Teen Cafe and the Globe at Night, uh, since we did have some people in the chat who were, you know, um, rightly so, a little concerned about the increase in light pollution. And so since uh, Kit Peak with uh, our colleague uh, Constance Walker is leading that Globe at Night program for that awareness, I thought uh, if you could speak on it, it'd be great. And maybe just a little bit about the Teen Astronomy Cafe. Yes, and I also put the link to that uh, 50th anniversary newsletter in the chat, John, I found it. So that is in the chat for people right now. Uh, but yes, the uh, Connie, actually, Connie Walker actually runs a variety of light pollution education programs. The Citizen Science Program Globe at Night, globeatnight.org. We can put that link in either the chat or in the show notes when we uh, post the recorded version of this video. People go out and actually observe the night sky and record their observations and put them into our database so that we have a record of what the night, bright night sky brightness is. We do this since 2006, so we have a 14 year timeline here now. So if you get a nice long timeline, don't think if you do it once that you can't take another observation the next year, especially so we get a nice long baseline of observations and see how the sky changes over time. Uh, but Connie also ran the dark and quiet, was involved in the dark and quiet skies workshop earlier this year in a satellite constellation workshop. So she is doing a lot to pre preserve the night sky. And of course, I was dark and quiet skies for radio astronomy too. So um, there's actually efforts to preserve the quiet skies for radio astronomers as well. So there's a, you know, NOAA Lab is heavily involved in the dark and quiet skies programs there as well, both for the public as well as for professional astronomers as well. Um, and the Teen Astronomy Cafe program takes place the first Saturday of every month. We have already had the December one. We're skipping January because that's right after the holidays. But starting in February through May, the first half of every month, we have a Teen Astronomy Cafe where a, NOR lab, a professional scientist and astronomer, sometimes from NOR Lab or Stewart Observatory, tackles a topic. They give a talk about it. Then the participants get to actually get their hands dirty and dive into some data uh, through computer-based Jupyter notebooks. They actually get to play with the data themselves and to learn about how astronomers do their research. And uh, teenastronomycafe.org, I believe, is the website for that. Um, so we'll put that in the show notes as well. So we can look that up as well. Or you can go to noirlab.edu and look, click on educational programs and find it there as well. So those are two places you can find them at noirlab.edu and the education tab will get you there as well. So I also mentioned the McMath Pure Solar Telescope, John. That's another one named after someone on Kitt Peak. That's true. And, uh, <laughs> I had the honor of giving the, uh, the, the, it was designed by an architect named Myron Goldsmith. And a few years ago, I had the honor of giving his daughter her husband and two of, a couple of his grandkids a tour of the McMath Pierce, um, and afterwards they gave us a they gave us a book of based on his architecture to uh to our stuff so in our library now. There's a copy in our library, I believe, and the cover of the book, which is the you know which covers the architecture of his life, is the McMath Pierce. So it's definitely considered one of his uh, uh great works in his career, which I found interesting. So it's a it's a great it's, book, and you can check it out in the the Noir Lab library if you ever if we ever get back in the office. <laughs> It's, it's certainly one of the most spectacular telescopes I've ever seen. 
Yes, it is. So and anyway, observed on. Yes, yes, it is it's a fantastic, fantastic building and a wonderful telescope as well. So anyway, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Thank you, John, very much for this. We've had a great turnout and a great, great conversation in the chat. There's obviously a great deal of interest in this topic. So uh, I think maybe we'll have to do some more history of Kit Peak stuff, maybe get someone who talk about the construction of when or the math Pierce or things like that in the future to do that. Cause uh, but the conversation here is obviously there's an interest in the his historical aspect of uh, telescopes here as well. So anyway, just to let the audience know, we're gonna be taking a break for the next two weeks. There's gonna be no live from NORLAB the, the next few weeks due to the holidays. However, we are going to be uh, promoting some of our, our best of episodes on our social media channels. So check those out next couple weeks as well. All our live from NORLABs are archived here. We come back on January 13th, I believe, with live from NORLAB at Gemini, correct, Jamika? Yes, that's correct, Rob. Thank you. So January 13th, after the break, we'll be back at our regularly scheduled time on Wednesday. That's going to be um, for Hawaii, 2 p.m. HST, which of course is 5 p.m. MST, and that is going to be the 13th, live from Noir Lab at Hawaii. So we look forward to y'all joining us then. And in the meantime, we hope you are safe and have um, a good rest of this, water as we wrap up the rest of this year. And I'll leave it over to John to give our final, our final farewell. Well, thanks very much for having me, and I certainly encourage uh, all of those uh, potential young astronomers watching, and uh, I know there's some older ones watching too. Uh, I certainly decided I wanted to be an astronomer in about seventh grade and uh, stuck with it right all, all the way through and uh, ended up, you know, working kind of around the world too, as well as having, uh, um, you know, met a lot of uh, interesting people and done some fun, fun work. Thank you, John. This has been a great one. And thank you for the person that complimented my Kit Peak t-shirt. So, <laughs> signing off from this week from NORLAB. Bye, Jamika. And thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. 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 Hmm.